Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book review. Today I will be reviewing Toward the Flame, a memoir of World War I. I selected this book in honor of Memorial Day. This book is the memoir of an infantry officer's accounts from World War I. The reason I read this book was because I had a history course from 1915 to 1945. I bought it while studying at Frostburg State University. The spine has that used bookstore, university store uh, tag on it. It is a fascinating read. And the essay I was doing was to try and glean whether or not using only this book we thought Hervey Allen was in support of the war or against the war effort. I, like I said, I studied this book for a course and as you, as I look through it again right now, I see a lot of highlighting, I see a lot of marks that I bookmarked certain pages because a lot of these pages are exceptionally important. This book is a published memoir, a infantryman's perspective on what would soon come to be called post-traumatic stress disorder. What's special about it is how frank Hervey Allen is in regards to feelings of death, and I'm gonna try and find a quote regarding that right now. Men who have faced death often and habitually can never again have the same attitude towards life. It is hard to be enthusiastic about little things again. The fact that everybody is soon going to die is a little more patent than before. One sees behind the scenes, the flowers and the grave blinds, the opiate of words read from the good book and the prayers. For there is death, quiet, calm, invincible, and there is no escape. Yet there are compensations. For instance, one loses one's horror of the dead themselves. They have so patently lost all personality, and to the soldier, the process of their incorporation with the mineral kingdom is a visible one. Earth is claiming them again. It is my honest opinion, a very humble one, that the sight of battlefields must always be a great blow to the lingering belief in personal immortality. The least that can be said is that the subject was never mentioned by anyone contrary to the statements of religious enthusiasts and the stock cant of journalism. There is no man who is so totally absorbed by the present as the soldier. It claims all his attention, and he lives from moment to moment in times of danger, with an animal keenness that absorbs him utterly. This is a happy and saving thing. With time to brood, conditions would often seem intolerable. To the soldier, now is everything. It is in the piping times of peace and leisure that man has had the time to afford himself the luxury of an immortal soul. When the present world is not engrossing enough, we begin to ponder on another. I shared that passage with a friend. This friend had served as a corpsman. A corpsman is a person in the Navy that is the medical side of the Marines. I had asked him about some of these passages, and he had some interesting insight that it was basically the thoughts of a soldier in the moment are very similar to this, that death holds a different meaning when you've held your friend dying in your arms. It's tragic to think that this still happens to this day. Right now, the, the big war in the headlines is Ukraine versus Russia, and I imagine similar accounts are going to be created from that conflict. And there were moments of, I want to say, levity. Moments like in this page here, page 116, the sergeant regaled us with the tale of a battalion of women machine gunners seen among the bocce. They were said to have worked their guns to the last, of course, and to have died like true Amazons. I heard this story several times, but was never able to run it down. It was part of the romantic male gossip of the battlefront. It grew very circumstantial as time went on. Occasionally, pictures of German girls in uniforms would turn up in the dugouts, which may have been responsible for the origin of the tale. Besides, it was such a nice story. Every soldier would like to tame an Amazon. We had been away from women now for several weeks. Members of the tribe of Amazons are to be encountered only upon the confines of glamour and of sleep. It's nice to think that throughout the centuries, me, uh, men have had kind of the same thematic sexual desires. That it's not just the, the serene and calm and uh, demure girl that's the dream, but the and even big women, strong women, are their own kind of dream. Another aspect of this book 
that really impressed itself upon me while I was reading it were all these moments where Herbie Allen, and this is partially taken from his diaries as these events were happening, and him thinking to write it down while wounded in a French hospital. He has all these small accounts of people he met that he knew from t time in the Pennsylvania National Guard that he met, but then he talks about where he found out later that they died. So for example, Wyke and I went to pay a visit to Lieutenant Fletcher, the scout officer of the 3rd Battalion, whom I had met at Corpoil, searching for his outfit. I describe him because he was the kind of man whose essential strength of personality stood out clearly. In all that mud and confusion, he was living under a wagon, clean, clear cut of feature, merry and wise, with a few good books around him, and something succinct and amusing to say. Fletcher was always commenting on things. Under the wagon he was dry and clean and that was typical. No mud of any kind ever touched him. All the filth and littleness of that vast experience of war passed him by like the unremembered faces on the street. Only its vastness, its youthful vigor, and its sacrifices were real to him. Yet he was a better man physically than most, a fast runner, a good shot, handsome, a keen thinker, deeply conscientious, with a broad sense of humor and a catching laugh. He should have lived to have children instead of being snuffed out later on in a miserable garret in fist mess by a chance shell. I went to pay him 20 francs I owed him and to hear what he had to say. Wyke and I sat around while his striker brought us something to eat, coffee in big canteen cups and white bursting boiled potatoes and jackets. Fletcher waved his hands about majestically and ironically quoted Rubaiyat. It seemed like spreading a Persian carpet in the woods. We all laughed with Omar, taking his advice about the wine literally and applying it. Fletcher had a canteen full hanging under the wagon. There are moments like that scattered throughout this book, him meeting a guy named Glenn, who later died a few days before Armistice. Him finding a friend from Pennsylvania, and he never saw that friend ever again. It is a very real portrayal of war. And on a day like Memorial Day, this is the kind of person and memory we need to honor. The, the kind of thing we are expected to honor. These are the men who died, who don't have their stories written down, except for a small snippet in an immortal piece of literature. Hervey Allen was injured in combat. I spoiled that a, a bit ago, but what happened is written in the last few chapters of this book. A French general directs the American general to have his men storm a bridge across a river the far flank had machine gun nests overlooking it, and there were lots of casualties just trying to cross the bridge. Eventually, they were gunned down and approached by German flamethrowers. Hervey Allen survived, injured, was saved by his allies, and he was brought to a French hospital. While recovering, he wrote down as much of this in his diaries that hadn't already been written. The copy of this book that I have includes a small section afterwards. The following extract, taken from a newspaper clipping of First War Memoirs of an AEF Commander by Major General R. L. Bullard, USA, gives a more official version of the fighting about Fismes and Fismet, with some interesting sidelights on the affair from higher up. In Fismet, the portion of the village of Fismes on the north side of the vessel, I had a single company of infantry, 150 men of the 28th, Pennsylvania Division. One day, I was ordered to make a raid with this company. It was made with great determination, but the bluffs of the river to the east, north, and northwest were lined with enemy machine guns, and the company, thus covered on three sides by the enemy's fire, had no success. It was driven back into its cellars in Fist Met. This company could be reinforced and fed at night only across a broken bridge, now not even a foot bridge. This crossing was swept from two directions by enemy machine gun fire, and men crossed, whether by day or night, only at intervals, and then only a man at a time. In short, men could not cross. It was evident that whenever the enemy desired, he could wipe out the company on the north bank of the vessel. After its failure in the raid, as ordered by our French general, I ordered that the company withdrawn to the south bank of the vessel river, man by man, at night. My chief of staff, who was very much in favor of the general's idea of bridgeheads, knew of the order which I was going to give. When I returned from Fismes late in the afternoon, I found our French general at my corps headquarters, 
and that the, my chief of staff had informed him of my order to withdraw the company. The French army commander ordered me at once to replace it. It was done. Three or four days after this affair, without my ability to reinforce it or save it completely at the mercy of the enemy, this company was wiped out by an enemy attack. Then I noticed that the French communique of the day reported that my third corps had repulsed an enemy attack. When the French army commander appeared at my corps headquarters, he offered me as consolation for his error this French communique. It was at least acknowledgement of the responsibility for the mistake, but it did not console me for the only accident of my military career. I reported it at once to the American commander-in-chief, General Pershing, in the following letter. He then communicates the uh, detail of this battle, signs it R.L. Bullard, Major General N.A., Commanding 3rd Army Corps. The next subheader is Pershing Irritated. A few days later, I saw General Pershing himself. He told me that he had seen the letter that he understood. He was much irritated and asked me with vehemence, Why did you not disobey the order? I did not answer. It was not necessary to answer. The general had spoken in the vehemence of his irritation. While I recall this incident with some bitterness, I must still give the French general credit for being ever ready to help and helping me and my corps. And he was a fighting man. He never ceased to press the enemy. Hervey Allen did not include that section in his book. The narrative ends with this paragraph. Suddenly, along the top of the hill, there was a puff, a rolling cloud of smoke, and then a great burst of dirty yellow flame. By its glare, I could see Gerald standing halfway up the hill with his pistol drawn. It was the Flammenwerfer, the flamethrowers, the men along the crest curled up like leaves to save themselves as the flame and smoke rolled clear over them. There was another flash between the houses. One of the men stood up, turning around, outlined against the flame. Oh, my God, he cried. Oh, God! Herbie Allen went through the trenches, and he came out changed. And there are moments of sadness, and of contemplation, and of violence, of humor, and of love. All manner of emotions happened along those front lines. In a story that would almost seem like it was cut out of a, like a redneck movie, a redneck documentary, he describes how the French taught him a trick for finding fish, throwing a hand grenade in the creek nearby, thus they would have fresh fish. Or moments where they end up meeting a woman who shares her house and her wine with the soldiers. She is the last woman in the place. Her husband and two sons are dead. Army, of course. There is nothing to live for. This is the second time in four years that this town has been wrecked. He also references in a footnote, see the author's poem, The Blind Men. This book is a priceless trove of stories and of moments from war. A war no man living remembers participating in. And on the weekend of Memorial Day, as we consider all the facets of U.S. military history, it is important that we remember and consider not just the thoughts of the generals, not just the thoughts of the historians, but the lives of the soldiers that lived through the trenches. I don't know how much I paid for this book. I couldn't tell you. But what I can tell you is that every single piece of it that I marked Every single piece I bookmarked, highlighted, and even the parts I didn't are near and dear to me. And I think if you have any appreciation for those that came before us, you should read this book. My name is Wildstag. Thank you for tuning in to another used book review.